Welcome to the Advanced Transportation Technology Seminar, and uh, I'm Max Donath, but I'm first going to have Hannah Grun go over some of the basics uh, of the seminar. So, Hannah, you can take over. Welcome, everyone. Um, as you're probably used to hearing by now, we have uh, this seminar is both has a live audience and will be streamed on the web. Oh, sorry. Um, let me just mute that computer really fast. <laughs> There's a five second lag, you can correct yourself. Now you know that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we have a live audience today as well as one on the web. So we ask for the live audience to please hold your questions to the end and use the microphone so those online can hear. For those of you online, um, please type any questions in the chat box or email them to the email address listed in the description. And um, we also ask that you report how many people are watching at your location so we can report an accurate count to the USDOT. Um, finally, if you are a student enrolled in the course, please fill out an evaluation form over there if you haven't already and put it into the envelope. So thank you. Uh, we're very honored to have uh, Professor Don Fisher, uh, who is the Department Head of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and uh, is presently on leave at the Volpe Transportation Research Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he's kindly joining us here. Uh, uh, Dr. Fisher has a very interesting background. This started off in philosophy and then decided, hmm, and went into psychology. And uh, through some interesting uh, serendipity, if you will, ended up in the, as an industrial engineer in the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at Amherst. He has an incredibly broad background in the human factors of driving, but many other issues. Uh, he told me how to order a cup of half-decaf coffee, and it was kind of insightful as to, do you put the caffeinated part at the bottom or the undecaffeinated at the bottom of your cup? I won't, I'll let you think about which way would you pick your cup of coffee. But the bottom line is, uh, he's worked on how to educate teenage drivers to scan appropriately. Uh, he studied older drivers and how they make decisions and scan the environment. Worked with motorcyclists, pedestrians, on every which way to get people to pay more attention to their driving. And uh, I think he's very pleased that he ended up in an engineering department because he felt that being in engineering, he had an opportunity to see change actually happen out there on the road. So without further ado, uh, Professor Fisher is going to be tied, doesn't have a title on the screen, uh, but he's going to talk about distracted driving the last two seconds of your life. Thank you very much, Professor Donath. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here to be speaking uh, uh, with you. I remember in the 1990s when my kids were very uh, young, I was doing a lot of work as a mathematical psychologist, as uh, Max said, in a industrial engineering department, uh, predicting millisecond differences that were important in the relation between a human and a machine, a driver in a car sometimes, but not always that. Uh, but not predicting millisecond differences that had something to do with life and death. And so I couldn't imagine uh, the loss of the life of my two children. Uh, I wanted them to grow up someday, to get married. They did. I was hoping they'd go on and have children. They did. I'm now a grandfather. But um, as you can well imagine, I was motivated to change my career in part because of the events around me. Not every parent is lucky enough to see their kids grow up and someday become a parent and have children themselves. So the question is, what could I do about it? As most of you know in this group, or may not know, I'm not sure about your exposure with novice drivers, and I'm going to talk mostly about that research today, although I'll have information for you as adults and older drivers. Uh, the crash rate during the first uh, six months is horrific. This is the first six months after you're out of the learner's permit phase. You either have an unrestricted or restricted license, depending on how old you are. Um, it's some 10 to 9 times higher. This is uh, fatalities per uh, 10,000. 
uh, drivers, and you can see how it's across age, it really goes up. And the older drivers that get all the bad press, uh, the per capita rate really isn't all that bad. Um, so how bad, how difficult a problem, how problematic a problem is distracted driving? Well, the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety has estimated that uh, distraction is involved in, not the cause of, but involved in a uh, factor in some 60% of the traffic crashes. So clearly we're talking about uh, something uh, distraction, which is a major part of the reason uh, teams are crashing, and actually it's, a, it's, it's, I think, a part of the reason we're seeing for the first time ever a possible increase like a 15% in the fatalities during the first six months. We may go from 33,000 uh, road deaths to uh, 40,000 road deaths this year. Uh, that was predicted uh, in June. We'll see. But I think uh, these devices that we have in the car are finally beginning to have an effect not only on teen driver behaviors, but uh, adult behaviors. Um, I'm director of the Arbella Insurance Human Performance Laboratory. There you see our Saturn sedan. Uh, we only have three screens. I saw your beautiful simulator. It has five screens. Little does Max know I moved a truck up to the back of uh, your lab, and now he has two fewer screens, and we have two more screens. But I don't think he'll notice for a long while since he doesn't get over there that, oh, Max, I'm sorry. <laughs> he was very generous. He said, take whatever you need. So anyways, <laughs> um, I couldn't do my research without the help of the people in the university in, in distraction and everything else we do, without the help of the people in the University of Massachusetts Transportation Center, Dr. John Kalura, Professor Michael Nodler, who's now head of that center. Um, and so it's a combination of the work uh, both in the mechanical and industrial engineering department and in uh, civil and environmental engineering that uh, I will talk about. Uh, today. And more broadly, we work with uh, psychologists, uh, computer scientists, electrical engineers, everyone across uh, the campus. As you all know, um, as, uh, as a university employee, they give me absolutely nothing to support my research, so I have the usual uh, set of sponsors who I want to thank up front, the state and federal uh, foundation, um, private sponsors. This is just a small list of the sponsors. It takes an awful lot of money to make a lab go as uh, any of the professors and, and students here, I assume, know. And uh, for me, it takes lots of little grants. Uh, some people are lucky and get few uh, big grants. Uh, the research we do, I'm just going to talk briefly about this at the very beginning. Uh, we're interested in the causes of crashes, in particular, what factors uh, impact those. And of course, age and experience are one. Here you see uh, distracted drivers at the top. Uh, but we also do novice and older drivers. We do a lot of training. I'll talk to you about the training we do today uh, to reduce the problems that come from distraction, that come from inexperience, that come from being too old. Um, we do that training uh, on simulators. We do it in mobile platforms. We do it on the web. We, uh, we now download it to the phone. Um, we're very worried about infrastructure crashes. We have a university transport, a member of University Transportation Center uh, with the University of Iowa. And um, there we're worried about, uh, there our, our, our mission is to use driving simulators to better understand how infrastructure improvements at roundabouts uh, in bicycle lanes can lead to fewer crashes. Uh, we also uh, are very worried about ITS, inside and outside the vehicle. I use this term loosely. You probably wouldn't lose it the same way. But outside the vehicle, we have all sorts of, uh, all sorts of information on uh, where we could uh, uh, indeed, uh, which of the several routes we could take inside the vehicle. We have the collision warning systems. And of course, now we have uh, uh, v V2X, vehicle to bicycle, vehicle to infrastructure, um, and so on and so forth. So this is a broad picture of what's done in the lab. And again, only with the cooperation of uh, uh, tens, if not hundreds, of colleagues across campus. So distracted driving, what can be done? All of you are engineers. You're f familiar with the three E's. Um, and their education, their engineering, and their enforcement. I'll talk about each of those, and I'll talk about how, if we're interested in reducing the problems of distraction, we can indeed, either with education or with engineering or enforcement, uh, reduce those problems. Uh, there's a fourth E now, and I can't remember what it is. What is it? What is it? Emergency response? Maybe that's, is, is that the fourth E? OK, I don't have anything in there about that. That's good. Okay, all right. Um, so teen and experienced drivers. Um, we think of teens as largely careless. 
and maybe they are, maybe they aren't. One of the things we do when we examine uh, the difference between one population of drivers and another population of drivers is first find out whether the differences we think are there are there. And then we use that information to diagnose the problem and develop training programs. So the first question is, is there really a difference between the extent to which novice and experienced drivers are distracted? We think that they're careless or clueless, but we don't know that. So we ran an experiment. That's an eye tracker. It is that lightweight, that simple. All of you have seen eye trackers before, won't be surprised. Those of you who aren't may be surprised by how, um, how invisible it really is and how lightweight it is. Uh, it has optics on it, optics that show the uh, roadway ahead as well as optics that uh, uh, scan the iris, so on and so forth. So it overlays on top of uh, the video that you're getting of the real world, the crosshair showing you where you're looking. Um, as I said, we have only three screens. It's the same, uh, same um, simulator as you have. It's an RTI, Real-Time Technologies Incorporated. And uh, we, like you, is that a Saturn sedan? Well, you see, ours is a 1995 Saturn sedan, so I didn't even recognize the Saturn sedan you had. I mean, it looked like something out of the... And I drive a 2001 Odyssey, so you can see anything beyond 2002 is, uh, is way beyond me. So the typical setup, driving simulator, so on and so forth. And what we then had the teens do, since we were interested in distraction, is a task that has some face validity. If we ask the teens to text, if we ask the teens to do, at, use their smartphone, we're asking them to do things they shouldn't. And although it's a laboratory environment, it's not the best of ideas. So we want to create in-vehicle tasks which have a face validity. Uh, this doesn't have as much face validity now as it did back when we were using it, but you have to get change uh, from, often it's the center console, right? You have to get change when you're going through a toll. Now we have electronic tolls, so maybe that's less valid, but you've got to get change. When you get change, you usually have to look away because you can't tell just by reaching, which is a quarter, so on and so forth. Second, uh, this is uh, Minnesota, and we know in Minnesota, one of the things you have is ice and snow, and one of the things you have to do is actually adjust the defroster, so on and so forth. And that actually does take your eyes off the roadway for a not inconsiderable amount of time, either uh, several glances spread over a long time or a long single glance. Either way, it takes the time to adjust the defroster. All right, so this is, these are the in-vehicle tasks we had them doing. And we would gather their eye movements with the eye tracker while they were doing these tasks. Here's an example of a video of a person not doing the task, uh, uh, two tasks that I just described, but another task. They were actually uh, texting. This was during a study of texting, uh, much before we did this. And uh, here's, here's what you see. Um, and it should be fairly clear uh, when you look at this that the driver is glancing inside the vehicle for a fairly long period of time. As a matter of fact, right there, they're glancing inside for uh, four or five seconds. Now, any of you are familiar with the naturalistic driving studies or the work by Bill Horry and uh, Chris Wickens know that 80% of the glance is longer than 1.6 seconds. Uh, the 20% of the glance is longer than 1.6 seconds lead to 80% of the crashes. This is on a driving simulator. In the naturalistic uh, driving studies, uh, and this is to be too brief, but I, I will, any uh, glance longer than two seconds increases the crash risk by uh, a factor of three. Of course, any, gl any glance inside is not a good idea, but we do have to glance inside. So uh, the question is, are novice drivers, um, do novice drivers have glances inside the car of a long duration much more frequently than do an experienced driver, than do experienced drivers? And what they used to do is focus on the mean glance duration. Uh, they said, okay, it, the, the question is, are, are, novice drivers, is not, are novice drivers' mean glance durations about uh, the, the same or are they different? In point of fact, the, the average glance durations of novice and experienced drivers are about the same. So we're never finding much difference. But then it was Horry and Wickens and others who said, well, what's really going on here? When you have a crash, it's because you're looking away from the forward roadway for too long, okay? So what we have to look at the tails of the distribution. The tails of the distribution uh, may not affect the mean a lot, but they could be radically different in, uh, 
in those frequencies. So, okay, let's see what we find. Um, I'll X that out and hope everybody's happy. They are happy. Okay. So what you would have seen right there is how we code that. We code this manually. You could code it with um, the, the, uh, uh, our software from uh, Applied Science does let us code that. So we, uh, you, can, you can mark an AOI down and an AOI up, but it's so easy to code by hand that we end up coding it by hand. And essentially during uh, every task, we ask whether there's a glance longer than two seconds. We could ask about the uh, proportion of especially long glances. Instead, we're asking about the proportion of glances with at least proportion of glances, proportion of tasks with at least one glance longer than two seconds, okay? And we know that's especially dangerous. So what do we see? Again, we're looking at middle-aged drivers, we're looking at novice drivers. And now the green line is the younger drivers. And this is an inverse cumulative distribution. So here's the threshold in seconds. We could look at the proportion of glances greater than zero seconds. And of course, the proportion of glances greater than zero seconds is 100%, since everybody, when they glance inside, spends some time. And then we could look at the proportion of glances greater than five seconds, and well, there are relatively fewer. So this is an inverse cumulative graph. Usually it goes the other way, right? Inverse cumulative graph. Green line is the younger drivers. Uh, red line is the uh, experienced drivers. Max, would you remind me what time I'm supposed to end this? At 4 o'clock. At 4 o'clock. Okay. Um, red line is the uh, experienced drivers. So what's happening here? Well, if we look up here, we see 80 point, 80% of <coughs> the tasks uh, performed by the in-vehicle task, performed by the novice drivers were one in which a glance was longer than two seconds. And look at the experienced drivers. <coughs> Only in 5% of the tasks did they have a glance longer than two seconds. I remember our son was at the wheel. He started texting. We were horrified. He said, don't worry, worry, Mom. I can text and drive. I forget how we resolved that. <laughs> Anyways, um, the point is you can text and drive. It's just that you can't always text and drive safely, right? Anybody can text and drive. OK. So is there a problem? Yes. What can we redo, do to remediate the problem? And again, I'm going to talk about solutions in engineering. Solutions in education, solutions in enforcement. Um, so the first solution I want to talk about, I want to make sure I'm not going through these in the wrong direction, um, is a training program. It's called SimFocal, simulator-based attention maintenance training, simulator-based focused FOC concentration and attention learning. Simfocal, and what we're trying to do is train drivers to keep their glances inside the vehicle to no longer than two seconds. There's a large debate among us, there still is, about whether this is something you want to do. Are you really training the drivers what you want to be training them? That indeed they shouldn't be glancing inside, and if they do, they shouldn't glance longer than two seconds, or instead are you training them, yeah, it's safe to glance inside, just don't make it longer than two seconds. Um, in point of fact, we try and do both. We do know that if you don't tell young drivers that the glance should be two seconds or less, what are we going to see? We're going to see a horrific situation where 80% of them glance longer than two seconds inside. That's unacceptable. So we have to do something. This is what we've come up with. There may be a better way to, and I'll talk about a different and maybe better way to do the same thing. But what we do is we developed a training program on the simulator to, in fact, train the novice drivers to keep their glances under two seconds. Now, I have a couple questions, one question up here at the very least. How would you design SimFocal? We have always operated under two or three principles. Number one, we wanted our programs to be freely accessible uh, and 
we wanted them to be accessible. So the driving simulator we used for the training was not a uh, half million dollar RTI. Instead it was, I forget anyways, uh, about a less than an order of magnitude expensive uh, simulator, an STI simulator, okay? And the code on that's very easy to write. You could sit down and write the scenarios you're gonna see in seconds. Uh, second, we wanted uh, to make sure that the training program not only could be easily, uh, we, we could just mail the code to anybody who had an STI, and thousands of people have STI simulators. Not only that, but indeed they didn't need any fancy training and eye movement monitoring. Okay, so you couldn't use an eye tracker. So here we are using a different simulator and no eye tracker, and how are we going to train the people to keep their glances under two seconds? Well, for a while we really struggled. We always struggle for many different reasons. But anyways, we struggled. How are we going to do this? And it was really important that we do this because we really wanted to teach people to keep their glances inside the vehicle under two seconds, but we didn't have an eye tracker. And the only way you can do that is with an eye tracker. Well, I forget. I had a dream one night. You remember Kukuli had the dream of the benzene ring and he figured out how you could have six electrons and six. I had a dream of how you could train people to keep their eyes inside the vehicle for no longer than two seconds without an eye tracker. And here's how we did it. Here's the driving simulator. This is an STI. Um, and you can see the graphics are much less. Uh, um, this is an older STI. The, the new STIs have graphics. the equivalent of the RTI. Anyways, this is an older STI, but we didn't need the graphics for that uh, purpose. And the study was undertaken. This is just an independent study by, no, it was an honors thesis by uh, Anna Vaca, so I want to thank her. And there were three parts of this training program. Uh, you're, you're thinking, hopefully, all along about how in the world we're going to do this without an eye tracker. Um, there are three parts of this training program that it's always important to keep in mind. One, we want the driver to make mistakes because if a driver doesn't make a mistake, he or she doesn't believe that indeed the behavior which is being attributed to him or her is something that indeed would occur, right? I tell you that indeed you're a bad driver, you're not going to believe me because you don't have any experience of it. So what we do, need to do is make sure in the training that the driver actually does something that he or she thinks they don't do. So we've got to catch the driver making glances too long, but we can't measure their eye movements. Second, you need mentoring. And what do I mean by mentoring? I mean, we need to explain to the driver not only that it's not a good idea that you not look inside the car for more than two seconds at any one point in time, but we need to explain how crash risk is increased greatly when you do that. And finally, it's not enough simply to find the driver making a mistake himself or herself, to teach the driver why it matters. But it's also really important that you get the driver to master the skill. They've got to learn how to do an in-vehicle task while indeed keeping their glances inside to no more than two seconds. And all of that we had to do without an eye tracker. So how did we end up doing it? Well, here's the way. Can anybody guess how we did it? Yeah, Nicole, go for it. <laughs> Taking a video of their face? That would be good. We could take a video of their face and we could score it. Um, but to keep track of that in real time would be difficult because we'd actually have to be scoring it and we'd have to be timing them. It's so simple, it's, it's beautiful, and it may indeed not be realistic enough, but I, I think I'll be able to show you results which suggest it is. What we did was we replaced the center screen by a task which the drivers had to do, which mimicked an in-vehicle task. Now, when you're doing an in-vehicle task, can you see the forward roadway? The answer is no. So we replaced the center channel by the in-vehicle task that you'd have to be doing when you were performing that in-vehicle task, and you couldn't see the forward roadway. It was that simple. You pressed a button, the forward roadway disappeared. You look down, the forward roadway appears. What appe the forward roadway disappears. What appears when you look down? The task. What appears when you press the button? The task. Okay? And how do we get the time? Well, that's obviously that's simple. You get press another button when you want to see the roadway again. Okay? So this was a GPS task. People are using GPSs all the time to determine where they need to go. Um, sometimes, like Siri, 
it's fine if you're listening, but at other times, you actually have to be look, look where you're going. So there was a map task. That, the, the resolution isn't that clear, and I apologize for that. But anyways, that was a map task, and you had to find a particular location on it. And you weren't supposed to glance down for longer than two seconds while you were doing this. Okay, simple enough. Um, and it came back, and then that's the way we got the time. That's the way we got the, um, that's the, way we got the uh, 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 mistakes because the drivers would glance down longer than two seconds, and we'd know, Brian, that indeed, if you glanced down for four seconds and we showed it to you, there wasn't much you could say. Well, I didn't glance down for four seconds. I mean, you could distrust me, but, you know. Okay, so we got everything we wanted here. We no eye tracker. We're measuring the time they're looking down, and at the end of it, we've got a gotcha. We've got, we've got many trials where they glance down for more than two seconds. Okay. They got to press a button, yes. You're right, and um, indeed there's uh, a latency associated with that so that um, I think we allowed for a little more than two seconds for that, that time, but we weren't that, we, we weren't that concerned about that. If we were, we should have been including that in it. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you had to press a button both to bring up the display and then to uh, exit the display. Okay. So here's the way we ran the experiment. Half of them got symphocal training, half of them got placebo training. It was a uh, 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 random assignment, and um, we needed to decide uh, uh, whether to use a pretest and post test or whether just to do a post test. Sometimes we do pretest, post test, sometimes we do just uh, post test. Um, here I'm pretty sure we did only um, pretest, post test, and uh, these are the results. So the blue is the control group. They hadn't gotten any training whatsoever. The red is the train group. And what do we see? We see uh, this is the percentage of scenarios where the glances were greater than two seconds when they were doing an in-vehicle task. 80% of the, just, just as before, 80% of the people in this task on this simulator with just the button press as opposed to actually an eye tracker were glancing longer uh, and 80% of this were, had one glance that it was at least two seconds. The training had a great effect. Um, it was uh, now true that only 28% uh, had glances longer than, uh, uh, had scenarios where they glanced at least once longer than two seconds. And uh, as the threshold uh, increases, the percentage of scenarios uh, where the control gri drivers had a glance at least uh, two seconds or longer was 40%. It was way down around uh, 5% for the train drivers and so on. So this had a huge impact on the percentage of scenarios in which you had at least one dangerous glance. But of course there are two problems with this. Number one, we'd really like the results to generalize to the real world and this was a driving simulator. It's not the real world so who knows whether Indeed, when people are out in the real world, you're going to get this effect. And second, accessibility. As I said, our training programs are free, and we want them to be accessible to anyone anywhere. This is only accessible to people who can go to a uh, place where there's a driving simulator. So how do we make a PC-based training program that does the same thing? Maybe we're out of luck. Maybe this is the best we can do. Well, we said, let's try. So we developed something called PC Focal. Focal, again, forward concentration and attention learning. Uh, it was developed for a de desktop PC. There were no gaming controls. So how would you design the PC Focal such that, again, you have the same three problems, uh, or goals, if you will. You're not going to use an eye tracker. You got the three training desiderata. You want to make sure they make mistakes. You want to mentor them. You want mastery. Uh, you want generalization. You want to make sure this goes to the real world and you want it to be accessible, you want it to be accessible every, everywhere. Well, we're training on a PC, so that, that problem solved. But the generalization, the uh, training desiderata, no ability to use an eye tracker, those are questions that need solving. So here's what we did. Um, this was actually the first problem we solved. This took the, the longer time. Um, how are we going to use a PC to measure eye movements uh, without an eye tracker? And it should be obvious from this slide, now that you've seen the other slide, what we're going to do. Who wants to take a guess? What's going to happen 
when someone presses a button. Here you see a view of the forward roadway. The driver has to click on threats that appear behind those, uh, is it opaque? Opaque bars, okay, so if a pedestrian appears there or something. So they have to constantly glance at the forward roadway. Uh, what are we going to do in order to make this into a training task which teaches drivers that they need to keep their glasses under two seconds? Yeah, go ahead. Well, convert the screen, take the whole screen. And you're exactly right. We did it a little differently. That's exactly right. We split the screen. Um, so instead of seeing the upper half, the forward roadway, the same idea, functionally identical. Uh, now they saw down here in a map task. So now we're measuring without an eye tracker. The glance is inside and outside, actually a lot better than the, uh, the simulator one, a lot easier to press the button, so on and so forth. And we're getting uh, measures of whether they're clicking on the pedestrians when they're outside, and we're getting uh, durations of how long they're here. Now we could test this on the driving simulator, or if we want generalization, where do we have to test it? If we want to know whether this is working in the real world, we've got to test it in the real world. That is something that requires you to have, obviously, a driving instructor in the car and an eye tracker because you're going to be asking the person to be performing in-vehicle tasks, which are safety-related, because you'd never want anything to happen where they weren't doing something safety related. And you want the driving instructor with a handbrake there in case anything actually goes wrong. So does it happen out in the real world that training generalizes from the PC to the real world? This is the percent, the red line here is the untrained drivers. And the green is the trained drivers. And if you see up here, the results aren't as dramatic, but they're real world. Um, roughly 76% in 76% of the uh, scenarios where they're actually asked to perform an in-vehicle task, they glance down longer than um, two seconds, whereas in 60% of the scenarios uh, where they were trained, they didn't. Here, uh, the difference is 20 percentage uh, points, or there's a 50% increases in the glances uh, inside uh, longer than two seconds. Uh, among the untrained uh, drivers. So clearly the training is having an effect. We'd like to have a greater effect. Uh, there are other things we could do, and we're now working on it. But clearly the training is having an effect in the field. It's accessible anywhere. We're measuring eye movements. And hopefully instead of 80% of the novice drivers having glances longer than two seconds, now it's more like the 5% we see with the, um, with the uh, uh, experienced drivers. There was um, another program which got a lot of press. I don't know whether any of you have seen it. It's Distractology 101. It's developed by uh, Arbella in uh, uh, an effort to fully disclose the sponsors. It's the Arbella Insurance uh, Human Performance Lab. They've been gener very generous uh, sponsors over the years. Uh, I think this trailer has cost them several million dollars to put together. We had nothing to do with the construction of the trailer nor the construction of the driving simulators. There are two driving simulators inside here, nor the construction of the driving simulators. What we did do was create the training programs. And there are two training programs about there. I'm going to talk right now about the first training program. And again, um, I'm going to ask you a question. But before I do, I don't know whether any of you saw uh, uh, NBC Today's show, but uh, as I said, this gathered a lot of press, national and local, everywhere it goes, throughout Massachusetts and New England. Uh, it's on TV. Uh, Katie, is it, no, Meredith uh, Vieira? Is that how you pronounce her name? Um, I don't know. Anyway, she was caught saying a four-letter word. M NBC's Meredith Vieira, and I blacked it out because I showed this in Saudi Arabia, and I wasn't sure exactly whether I'd be flogged or not if I showed it. I know if I showed it here in the States, it'd be okay. But anyways, all the, all the blank spaces are you ex know exactly what. So anyways, this made a lot of press, and she was driving, and uh, she said the four-letter word, and the question is why? What are we having drivers do? Well, remember... The example I gave of an individual who thought they could uh, indeed text and drive. The teens and Meredith thought they could text and drive. 
So we're trying to train them that they can't look down too far for too long. We don't have an eye tracker. We got the three training desiderata. We got everything else, and we got an additional problem. They're texting. What if they can text and don't crash? Then they come away thinking that indeed texting's okay. Or what if we're so sloppy as human factors engineers that all of a sudden when they look down, a giant bird appears in the middle of the road? That's not good human factors engineering. No one, no bird appears in the middle of the road. So we had to find a way for them to believe that when they were texting and they knew they were being watched, that they'd actually crash. I'll give you a video, I'll show you a video of this and see if you can guess how it was done. This is a, a real, this may not be the one that has the, uh, I don't see anything here. Um, I have a feeling it's on the next one. This might have the video. Um, I may have to click twice. Let me blow it up. Now, Katie, uh, Meredith wasn't this crazy, but, oh, uh, sorry, I'll bring it up again. It disappeared. It'll come back up, come back up. There you go. Um, so they know they're being watched. Wh why they do this, and the kid's not laughing, okay? So he's taking this seriously. And that's a crash. So how do you think we did this? How do we make it so that everyone came away crashing and everyone believed it was actually their fault? What was going on there? What we'd really like to happen, of course, is for there to be a program in there so when the kid looked down, uh, the vehicle would stop. But we didn't have any of that ability because the programming just didn't exist. There wasn't an eye tracker, right? And there wasn't anything remote. There was an experimenter in there. And this is how dangerous texting is. There was an experimenter in there. And the experimenter watched the person looking up at the road and down at the road. You talked about the reaction time. There's the reaction time of the experimenter. The experimenter would press a button. When the, when the man or woman, male or female, looked down, the car ahead would not come to an immediate stop. The dynamics, braking dynamics of the car ahead were almost identical. They were a little quicker. We wanted to edge it a little bit, but they, they, they were not out of range of a normal braking car. The braking dynamics of the, the driver's own car were very similar. You know, again, a little, a little bit uh, sloppier, but well within the range. 99% of the drivers crashed. An experimenter in there, watching Max look down and up, could know when Max was going to look down too long, press a button, right? Sees Max looks down that, process it internally, motor has to process down the arm, press the button, all the while you think Max going to look back up and not crash? No. So the program has been, as far as we know, a huge success in teaching this, and we are now following these drivers, and initial indications are that it's reducing crashes and citations by 20% uh, percent after, I think, a year of driving. Initial indications are that. Uh, I can't say what the crashes and citations are. We haven't analyzed that separately yet. Okay, so that program there goes from school to school, it appears to reduce crashes and citations up to a year later. We're not absolutely sure, so I don't want to make any very definite claim, but those are the initial analyses by statisticians both in our lab and in their lab. So is there a problem? Yes. Can it be evaluated easily? Yes. Uh, uh, can we train novice drivers? Yes. And could any jurisdiction here in Minnesota, Massachusetts, wherever, implement something like this? Uh, I think so. I'd be interested in your um, responses. Hazard anticipation. Are novice drivers good at hazard anticipation? And if they're not good at hazard anticipation, when they 
aren't distracted, how bad are they when they are distracted? Here is the University of Massachusetts campus, part of it. Here's my office right here. Here's an intersection right here, four-way signalized intersection. Um, hazard anticipation means generally what you think it means. I'll talk to you more specifically about what I mean, it, uh, what I mean by it in just a second. Here's that intersection. Imagine you're a car, in a car, traveling, let's call that south, okay? You've come around this long term, you're traveling south. Here's the, uh, here's the view you have of the roadway ahead. I got this off Google Earth. I was lucky. I couldn't believe it. Um, signal's red, but imagine the signal was green. There's a car in the right travel lane. You're the white car, green signal, your white car. Car stopped here, you're the car in the uh, left travel lane. Buzzing on by, of course, the stop car, since you got a green signal. Any red flags? Yeah. The car on the right stopped Had you been the driver of that white car, Allison Lustig would be alive today. The driver of that white car did not predict what he or she should have predicted. Indeed, that the car, probably an older driver thinking they were doing the pedestrian a favor. I don't know the exact details. Anyways, that the car on the right hand had stopped to let the pedestrian go. Or maybe it had just turned from red to green and the pedestrian had walked out. I don't know the details. I've never gotten a crash report. I do know it's 20 yards from my office. I do know I pass it every day. And I wish that indeed I'd known what you'd known. Fortunately, I wasn't that driver, and I can't imagine being the driver of that car. We have a crash like this every year on our campus. Fortunately, not, someone's, someone's not killed every, uh, every time. One of my graduate students was thrown in a crash just like this um, 20, 30 yards in downtown Amherst. It's the first thing I talk about in all my courses now, just because students and drivers don't realize how dangerous this particular multi-threat scenario is. So do novice drivers fail to anticipate hazards? Is it just novice drivers? Is it older drivers? We don't know. This is the same driving simulator we use to test this. We have the eye tracker. We have the screen. We have the steering wheel. Um, here's a scenario in which we use to test it. Uh, uh, we have two travel lanes, vehicles stop just like you had stopped before. Uh, this is a mid-block crosswalk, so in point of fact, um, it's even more obvious at one level that you should stop here. When you have a green signal and a driver's uh, stopped in the right travel lane and you're in the left travel lane, uh, if you're a good driver, you stop. Most drivers probably won't even give it a second thought, okay? Um, but here you've got a marked mid-block crosswalk. You should at very least look to the right. So here's, here's a video we get on our driving simulator of safe drivers. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. I hope you all do that. By the way, um, if I'm sounding preachy, it's not because I don't believe in the importance of all this. It's because I myself am the one who designed all these scenarios, and I designed these scenarios because I was a failure as a driver before I took up this research some 15 years ago. All these are scenarios are based on my failures. I'm lecturing to myself, not to you guys. I gotta pay attention. As a philosophy major, as an undergraduate, I learned not to pay attention to the real world. It's been a lesson in real world attention. <laughs> I kid you not, I still catch myself uh, in many, um, and here's an unsafe driver, and there's nothing. Go for it. Is it not happy? It was happy. Let's try once more. It took a while to pop up, I thought. It's not happy. Okay, what you'd see here, that's okay. What you'd see here would be a uh, video where the plus sign, the fixation, just stays straight ahead. No movement whatsoever, as opposed to the driver that just looked to the right. This driver's just straight ahead, as if that pedestrian never existed. Okay, so what do you think the difference is between the novice and experienced drivers? 
this is one of the most dramatic examples I have of why, indeed, eye behaviors tell you so much about driving. Here's the scenario. This is a Nuge Pradhan. He's gone on to a great career postdoc at uh, NIH. He's now uh, a major researcher at Umtree. This is a schematic of the scenario. You see the blue car is the driver. The brown car is the obstructing. The uh, uh, yellow circle is the pedestrian. High-tech uh, illustrations here. What do you imagine the difference are in the percentage of experience the novice drivers that glance towards a um, hazard on the right? Inexperience. These, these, are, these are the drivers on our campus, on your campus. So remember when you're a pedestrian, this data applies to the drivers here on this campus as well as anyone else. Um, well, maybe not in Minnesota, nice, I don't know, but anyways. 10% uh, uh, of the inexperienced drivers looked. This is after driving school, and I'm not blaming the driving schools. They weren't being told what needed to be done. Uh, these were 30-year-olds, these were 60-plus-year-olds. So in other words, me, I'm looking 60% of the time. Midway, you're looking about 30% of the time, and only 10% of the time right there. Huge difference in the hazard anticipation skills of novice and experienced drivers. And we found this again and again and again. Well, you ask, might ask, does this have anything to do with crashes? And the answer is yes. They have correlated, just as with the attention maintenance measure, they have cor correlated hazard anticipation skills with crashes. And the better are your hazard anticipation skills, the less likely you are to crash, okay? Not surprising, but you need that evidence, okay? So we developed a program called RAP, Risk Awareness and Perception Training, where indeed what we tried to do was train novice drivers to um, recognize scenarios in which uh, there were latent hazards. And by latent hazards, we typically mean hazards which could materialize but haven't yet materialized. It's not like a car is coming across the lane at you, um, but rather, just like there, there could materialize a pedestrian or there might not. So it's latent. It's possible. Um, in the training, there were 10 pretest scenarios and 10 post-test scenarios. And believe it or not, when we did this, this was back in 2000, PowerPoint tools were so bad that you couldn't take an object on the screen in presentation mode and drag it somewhere else. You had to be in construction mode. So we never presented this in PowerPoint presentation mode. It was always in construction mode. And what they had to do, remember there are three parts of a training program, mistakes, uh, mentoring, and mastering. They had to make a mistake. What type of mistake do you have to make for it to be real? Who knows? We didn't know. So we thought, well, we'll ask them to drag the yellow oval to a position on the screen where there could be a latent or hidden hazard. We'll ask them to drag the red circle to a position on the screen where they'd look for a hidden hazard. Okay? All right, different things. You can't see the hidden hazard. So yellow oval hopefully went there. Red circle hopefully went there. Do we have the first part of the 3M training program? Do we have them making mistakes if they're going to? Yes. They're not dragging the yellow oval to where it should be. And how do we score that? We've got a separate PowerPoint for everyone. It's easy. You just look at where they drag the oval, OK? High tech. The results here, I think you'll find dramatic. I mean, this is just horrible. Here is the truck. Uh, where's the? Um, which one am I looking for? I don't know. Any of these. Uh, look at how low they are in some of these scenarios, how unlikely they are to anticipate hazards. That's before training. After training, they see the same thing. They're way up there. But this is training on the PC where they're asked to see the same scenarios again. We had to know that it worked, but it's hardly surprising that they learned where to drag the oval, OK? So what you really need to know is whether this generalizes. And first, you want to know whether it generalizes to a simulator, because you don't want to spend the money to get them out in the road. So what we did was um, take them on a route in Amherst. And we had them 
that, those are university streets. That's actually right where the crash occurred that killed Allison Lustig. Um, this is a stretch of uh, highway, Route uh, 116. It looks like uh, any of the Minnesota throughways. Um, this is a commercial route, two travel lanes in each direction, business on each side. Uh, this is downtown Amherst, and um, this is a very rural route. Amherst is uh, uh, all within the space of uh, easily five square miles, six square, uh, nine square miles. You've got uh, every different possible type of environment. And when you do a field study, you can't easily control whether a hazard's going to appear or not. So we didn't know whether we were going to get any results. And in all of this stuff, you've got to ask yourself, and it may seem obvious while you're sitting here, but what in the heck's going through the kid's mind? They know you've got an eye tracker on them. They know you're looking at them. We're asking whether they're careless or they're clueless. Again and again, I'm struck by the fact they've got to be careless. If they were clueless, they wouldn't want to give you this information. Uh, they, I, they, if, I got it backwards, I'm sorry. I, they, they're, they're definitely clueless. Because if they were careless, they wouldn't want to give you that information. So let's see what we see. Here's the eye tracker. Here's downtown Amherst. So we can't stage scenarios, but we're lucky. We're lucky because the Amherst uh, town officials have decided uh, it's more important to collect a quarter uh, for parking than it is to free the space between the March Bid Block crosswalk and, a, and uh, six feet behind. So you can park right next to the crosswalk, either at the library where the little kids come out or at the firehouse where they visit. You can park right next to the crosswalk. I'm sure they wouldn't like it if they know I was saying this, but it's true those spaces are indeed metered. They've made some important changes, but they haven't made all the changes they need to make. So here's downtown Amherst. I have trained. Here's a crosswalk, Mark Mid Block. Look at this. This driver actually could probably cause a rear end collision, but they've clearly been trained. They've got the idea. They're looking where they should be looking. Here's an untrained driver. <coughs> Did they have any idea? Any idea whatsoever that a pedestrian could emerge from there? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. So, it's clear training can work. And indeed, not only did training work in the field immediately after you train people, you expect that. We have six months. I actually think it's 12 months later. This won a Best Paper Award. Um, here we have the experienced drivers. You test them at two points in time, they're 80%. Here we have the untrained driver. They're actually getting worse at hazard and taste patient. They go from 50 to 40%. Here are the trained drivers. Half an hour to an hour's worth of training, more like half an hour, brings them right after training. That's zero months. And I think this is 12 months later. I don't know why I have six months. It may be this slide was created. I, I meant to check it. I'm sorry. Anyways. The point is, this hour's worth of training, uh, six months, in an hour, you can get your novice driver, and some of you may have kids now, you can get your son or daughter to the point where they're halfway to what an experienced driver would do in terms of hazard participation with 12 to 15 to 20 years of experience out in the field. And it has an effect on crashes and citations, at least our initial data show. So not only an effect on behavior here, an effect out in the field. So yeah, there's something we can do about hazard anticipation. Cognitive distraction. I've got five minutes. I hope this serves as a lesson to you. Um, it served as a lesson to me. They say don't use your cell phone. I don't know how many of you, while you're driving, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the literature and the controversy around this. The naturalistic studies are actually finding occasionally that cell phones are prophylactic. By prophylactic, I mean your risk is less when you're on the phone than when you're not on the phone. Uh, the driving simulator studies are finding that, uh, indeed, uh, your risk has increased greatly due to, due to the work of David Strayer out at uh, the University of Idaho. John Lee at the University of Wisconsin and I have worried a lot about how in the heck these discrepancies could exist. I think it's safe to say we both believe, but I'll say I believe, that there is a resolution. 
and I'll tell you about it, and I'll see what you think about it. So this is an older driver. It's meant to represent an older driver. Um, same scenarios, we measure cognitive distraction now. So someone's on the cell phone. In our task, they're actually listening to a sentence, and they have to repeat uh, the subject, verb, and noun, and then have to say whether the sentence made sense or not. So it's a fairly intense task, but what we wanted to test was whether distraction would have any effect on um, hazard anticipation. And you may remember, in the Mark Midblock crosswalk scenario, uh, experienced drivers, when they weren't distracted, we're looking roughly 60% of the time. Inexperienced drivers, we're looking 10% of the time. So I want you to guess, if you were in this study, and we know you were monitoring your eye movements, okay, and you're all experienced drivers, and most of you are certainly above the age of 25, whether uh, you'd see a small uh, decremental performance, large decremental performance, or whatever. I mean, you drive all the time, probably you drive all the time talking on your cell phone, so you think you can do well. That's where you should look. That's the eye tracker we use. Here is the result. That's what I want you to look at. And this is a message I want you to leave you with. These are drivers your age and older. When they're not on the cell, blue line. Hidden crosswalk to the left, not to the right, to the left. They look 90% of the time. When you are on the cell phone, these are drivers who know their eyes are being monitored. This is you who know your eyes are being monitored. You don't look 20% of the time. These are scenarios where little kids could run out behind a truck. A school child could run out behind whatever. Are you willing to risk a life? Are you really willing to use your cell phone in areas where latent hazard anticipation is important. A little kid isn't going to sneak out into the roadway on the highway, probably. But it's going to happen downtown. It's going to happen on campus. And you're on the phone. All right. So that concludes what I wanted to talk about today. This will, I see we're out of time. Um, the last two seconds of your life could be those last two seconds while you're looking down. You won't have time to look up because at that point in time, the car in front of you will stop and you or that person won't make it through the rest of the day. It's that simple. You shouldn't spend time looking down inside the car because you can't tell when something you didn't predict at all is going to happen. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Remember we need to use the microphone? Yeah. Hi, hi Professor Fischer. Hi. First of all, it's really a, a very insightful talk. So Thank I have you. a quick question about like, what's the average length of the training period for the trained data? Uh, Half an hour typically, both for hazard anticipation and for attention maintenance. Uh, these are, this is not what I would recommend where these programs actually deployed. You need a lot more than that because you saw uh, hazard neither hazard anticipation nor attention maintenance behavior was anywhere near ceiling. But uh, it's very hard to get subjects as uh, uh, teen subjects to participate. So we get them for half an hour. We feel we're, we're lucky. Uh, if my recommendation would be that indeed this be used at least three or four times. Uh, by teen drivers before uh, actually I, I think it would have the lasting effect I'd like to see it have, yes. And, do, and during the training process, do they have to go through all kinds of scenarios or they, have, they are tested over all kinds of scenarios like uh, in terms of hazards? Yes, we have um, um, during the training there are typically 10 to 18 scenarios. And during the testing, we have both near transfer and far transfer scenarios. By near transfer scenarios, I mean trans if they were trained, you saw that plan view diagram. So if they were trained with that, then a near transfer scenario would be one out in the real world where there was a road coming in from the left. So it matched in perspective what you saw from a plan view. A far transfer scenario would be something where there was a latent hazard, but you'd never seen that particular uh, source before. And the change, uh, the, the transfer of training to the far transfer scenarios is actually very good. There's a reduction maybe only of 20 percentage point in the effect size. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
We have a question from an online viewer. He asks, in a classroom environment, if the curriculum design incorporated these types of potential scenarios using a combination of video and print based on your data, could this format work? Yes, absolutely. No doubt whatsoever. Yeah, if someone has, uh, as I said, all our programs are freely available, just uh, uh, email, have them email you or have them email me, Don Fisher, University of Massachusetts Amherst. You'll find my uh, email address. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to email the training programs to you. Great. So my thought is that certainly teen drivers create a lot of mayhem in the, in the short duration that they're teen drivers, but ultimately they're just teen drivers for a short duration of their lifetime, and then they're a problem for a much longer period. So I'm wondering what the kind of appetite is to present this for the greater population. So there's a, the, an entire fleet that we really should be getting to ceiling. And, and so I was just wondering your thoughts about that. Uh, I have three thoughts. Um, the first is that indeed your use of the word fleet uh, brings up the question of should uh, commercial drivers be trained with this uh, sort of training program, and I certainly think yes. The second is how can we inculcate in parents the same set of skills that they're giving to their kids. The answer is now that in some states they require parents actually to participate in some of the uh, driver education with their students. You don't want to tell parents that this is something they don't know. Rather you want to give them these training programs and allow them uh, to understand that indeed they're being given this so they can better train their students, okay? And by doing that then you don't take away their knowledge or make them feel foolish but they will learn something. And third, during the uh, learner's permit phase, uh, the parent really should uh, change radically the way he or she trains. They should put much more of the decision making into, into the hands of the uh, uh, novice driver because it's my conviction, this is not, this is now just uh, an hypothesis, it's my conviction uh, during the permit phase, uh, parents make so many of the decisions for their children that the reason you have this huge spike in crashes afterwards is because all of a sudden uh, the child's having to make all those decisions. So there aren't yet training programs to do that, but that could help uh, make future better drivers too. Yeah, I think, I think Nicole, yeah. I'm gonna hold on to the microphone for one more question. I'm curious about after someone becomes trained and better aware to spot these hazards and, and potential things, do people then become better trained to know when is an appropriate environment and time to engage in a secondary task? So if I'm gonna be checking my map, I know this is not the good time for it, and so do you actually get better at choosing times to be distracted and, and look away with experience? So another paper that got a, uh, it was nominated for a Best Paper Award was just that paper. Uh, it was delivered at uh, Human Factors. I forget whether we're publishing it somewhere or not. But uh, we wondered whether hazard anticipation training would do exactly what you said. If someone's aware that hazards are there, are they less likely to engage in an in-vehicle task? And then they're more likely to put the phone down if they're on it. The answer, uh, without any training whatsoever, in, without any mention whatsoever of this is what you should be doing, putting down the phone when you're in the area of a latent hazard, without any mention of the fact that you should stop the in-vehicle task when you see a latent hazard ahead, we found large and significant uh, effects. So just recognizing those scenarios turns out to have an impact on people's willingness to engage in secondary tasks, either secondary in-vehicle tasks or what we call secondary cognitive tasks, being on the cell phone. So I think we have to come to a conclusion. No, I'm not out of time. You're, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be around. Okay. Well, I just want to first say that next week uh, we're going to have Chen Fu Lao speaking on a positioning and mapping methodology using Bluetooth and smartphone technologies to support situation awareness and wayfinding for the visually impaired. So that's next week, same place, same time, et cetera. Now that I've made that announcement, I don't know when these guys are going to cut me off, but I'm more than happy for you to ask your question. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering if there would be some simple thing that people could learn, like uh, look down, one, two, look up, something like that, you know, where, in other words, you could get the feel of how long two seconds is. Now, that's not the same as the training, but the thing is that 
you know, the more people that know that two seconds is sort of the limit, and we know that people are going to be looking at Wait, other things be looking, in the yeah. car, so, and so that maybe if, you know, if that became something that you could, you know, something, something could be simple, it could be done with an instructor, it could be done with a parent. Um, now, you know, again, if you're doing it on the road, you know, you would you need to be careful about where careful. you would do yeah, it. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, to, and maybe to broaden the understanding of that sort of two-second rule, if that's... I think, I think that's a heck of a good idea. You know, I was backing out of the uh, car with my, uh, I think she was a six-year-old time, Annie, uh, in our Honda Odyssey. And um, uh, as I was backing out, she screamed at me, Daddy, Daddy, stop the car! Okay. She didn't have on her seatbelt. Now, um, what does that indicate? The safety culture had changed from one, one where parents didn't wear their seatbelts to it's so important to wear a seatbelt that the car, that the child is going to enforce the parent. So I think if parents started taking seriously, we could change the safety culture and the one, two count might work. Until the parents change their behavior, the kids aren't going to change their behavior. And right now, the, since the parents aren't changing their behavior, they're looking down and up for much too long. The only way to change the kids' behavior is to show them in person that they're glancing down too long. But after a while that works, safety culture does work. And once parents, I mean, my, my kids tell me, quit looking you know, down, they, they, will, they will tell me that. So they know my research better than I do. <laughs> so I, that, that takes longer to introduce, but is, is what ultimately we want. We want a safety culture where people don't uh, look down. Good point. Well, and, and the, what you say about making mistakes and catching mistakes yeah. is, you know, it, it. I was horrified when I timed how long I was looking down after I learned about the two-second rule. Well, please join me in thanking our speaker, Don Fisher. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank, Thank you. you. I've enjoyed greatly speaking with you. You're a wonderful audience. Take care.